Hello, my name is David Ansara. This is Solutions with David Ansara, a podcast where we focus on the world's most pressing and intractable problems. And we try to come up with solutions with our guests to these problems. And joining me today is John Endres, who is the Chief of Staff at the Institute of Race Relations in South Africa. John uh, has a very interesting background. Uh, he holds a PhD in Management Studies. Uh, he's very interested in languages, but also in economics. And uh, he last year wrote a very fascinating report, which we'll link to, about how to rescue South Africa's flailing economy. And the report goes into detail in, into some of the problems that South Africa is facing, why it has such low growth, and then also offers some solutions. Now, South Africa has no shortage of economic plans and rescue packages. Uh, but many, many of them don't really materialize. So I want to sit down with John today just to discuss uh, how this very simple, but potentially very impactful plan uh, could help turn South Africa's economy around. John, welcome to Solutions with David Ansara. Thank you very much, David. Um, and I'm very glad that you man mentioned intractable problems in your intro, because I think we do have quite a pile of them um, and we've got good opportunities to try to find solutions here. But yes, we do find ourselves in quite a sticky situation at the moment. Um, and of course, many people are thinking about what to do about that. We've also given it some thought. Um, so let's, let's go through the situation today um, and see what sort of solutions we can come up with. Okay, but before we come up with solutions, we need to accurately diagnose the problem. So what is the state of the South African economy? What is going on at the moment? So we've got a low growth problem. That's probably the, the main problem that we've got. Uh, South African economy grew pretty well between 1994 and about 2007, and also managed to create jobs during that time. Uh, the government finances improved quite a lot from the bad state they were in at the end of the apartheid era to about 2007. And if you look at all kinds of different charts, growth charts, deficit charts, uh, unemployment charts, it's almost as if you could identify two distinct periods before 2007 and after 2007. And uh, observers of the global economy will know that something very important happened between 2007 and 2008. And that was the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis. But in South Africa, there was a local development that was also very important. And that was the ascension to power of Jacob Zuma. And that marked a, a turning point in the country's fortunes uh, for the worse. And we now find ourselves in the position today where economic growth is really anemic, um, where South Africans are getting poorer from year to year on a per capita basis, and also in comparison with their global peers, and where unemployment, instead of coming down, is becoming even worse. And to give you just one example of how bad it is, a useful figure to look at unemployment is the so-called labor market absorption rate. And that just me measures the share of people in work out of the working age population. And that figure should sit between 65 and 75% uh, if you look at other countries in the world. And in South Africa, it's sitting at barely half that. It's between 38 and 40%. And that means that uh, there are far too many people who do not have jobs who would be able to work and probably want to work as well. And our situation is comparable only with that of failed states and countries that do not allow women to work. So that is the benchmark we're measuring ourselves against at the moment. And to change the country's fortunes, we need far more growth and we need a type of growth that brings people into the economy, that gets them working, and that gives them the prospect to improve their own lives through their own efforts. Okay, so those are some of the symptoms, but what are the causes, John? Uh, why does South Africa find itself in this position? Because in many ways, it has certain advantages that other countries don't have. It has pretty decent infrastructure, uh, deep and liquid capital markets, a relatively skilled workforce, or at least maybe a, a pockets of, of skills and excellence. So how come we're finding ourselves in this position, whereas other countries like Chile or uh, Malaysia, Turkey have, have kind of outcompeted us in terms of uh, the emerging market category? Well, I think you're, you're right to pick up on this, um, that in some ways our situation is uniquely bad. And the uniqueness is a result not of the given factors in our economy, 
Um, so in other words, you know, we're a commodity rich country. We've got lots of natural resources, we've got the potential to export. We've got uh, large harbors. We've got a long coastline. We've uh, got a good uh, communications infrastructure, deep financial markets. And all of these things should be factors that are very much to our advantage. And for some reason, we're not able to make good use of them. We also see that when we look at the past commodities boom in the early 2000, uh, 2010s, that other countries like Australia or Canada really benefited quite a lot from. And South Africa missed out on that commodities boom. And if you look at the context in which business operates in South Africa, I think that is where you will find this, the, the answers to the question of why are things not working out in South Africa? And partly this is because of uh, bad economic policies that serve to deter investment uh, and sort of discourage investors from putting their money into this economy rather than any of the other economies around the world where they could put their money. And some of those factors include in mining, for example, um, the Mineral Resources Act that removed mineral rights from previous owners of those rights invested all mineral rights in the custodianship of the state. And that means that miners, for example, now if they want to uh, explore or mine, need a license from the government. And getting those licenses is very onerous, very costly, and also very uncertain. It takes a long time. And so many mining companies are just not bothering to do that. And therefore, we're not unlocking the potential of our mineral resources. Another example is a certain form of protectionism where there is the feeling in South Africa that we should be producing goods locally in order to create jobs, which on the face of it sounds very sensible. But often the policy in order to achieve that is to try to protect the local market from foreign competition uh, through import tariffs, duties, and other factors. And ultimately, this ends up hurting both the consumers who have to pay higher prices for what they buy in South Africa or get worse quality, and also the producers who get away with not being as competitive as their international peers. And so these are two examples of policies that are not really helpful in trying to promote growth and get the economy going. Okay, John, and earlier you mentioned the astronomically high levels of unemployment in South Africa. But why do we have such low levels of labor absorption? What is happening at the policy level that's making it so difficult for us to employ more people? Well, at the policy level, let me come to the policy level in a moment, but what I would like to mention before we get there is that we've, we're getting a structural mismatch between the skills we've got in the economy and the structure of the economy as such. So if you think about the economy as consisting of the primary sector, which is agriculture and mining, the secondary sector, which is manufacturing, and the tertiary sector, which is services, the past 20 years have seen a very marked shift in the South African economy away from agriculture, mining, and manufacturing, and to services. Now, for the services economy, you do need people with a good education, mostly. If you think about finances or insurance business, if you think about online marketing consultants, if you think about lawyers, all of these are service businesses that require some sort of study, uh, some sort of degree, or at the very least, good education at school. And that is something we're not giving our children in South Africa at the moment. The metric pass rate, as it is communicated by the Minister of Basic Education each year, lies between 75 and 80%, but that is quite a misleading rate. And the reason we say that is that we track the progress of a cohort of children that enter school in a given year. In 2008, for example, there were about 1.1 million children that entered grade one. And we see what happens to them from year to year as they get older. And we see that by the time they get to matric, half have dropped out of school and only about 400,000 um, then pass their matric. So the true matric pass rate is closer to 40% rather than 80%. And then if you take an even closer look at the number of children who achieve good results in an important subject like mathematics, for example, we see that there's only about 50,000 children who achieve over 50% in mathematics out of the original 1.1 million. And so we are producing a very large number of school leavers each year who do not have good qualifications and therefore will find it very difficult to find a job in an economy that is dominated by the services sector. 
And that is um, partly a, a result of policy, but also a result of ideology in the education ministry. Um, so the uh, policies are not uh, designed to foster meritocracy um, or to uh, demand high achievement from children, but rather try to achieve high throughput rates at the cost of quality. And we see that, for example, in the fact that the metric pass rates have, uh, not the pass rates, the grades needed to pass metric have been reduced um, at several occasions in the past. And in some subjects, you can get a pass with 40% or even 30%. And that really is not the way to you know, get good results. Um, we mentioned earlier um, policies, labor market policies. So certainly there are some very uh, concerning factors in that area as well. One of course is the whole cluster of race-based legislation, um, such as black economic empowerment policies, affirmative action policies, et cetera, which uh, impose a drag on the economy and make it more difficult for businesses to find the right talent to hire. And they also give businesses an incentive to hire candidates who might not be quite the right candidates for the job. And the overall effect on the economy is a loss of productivity and a loss of competitiveness. And this leads to uh, declining growth and declining job creation. So John, I mean, obviously education is important, not just for equipping you with the skills you need to participate in the labor market, but also to have socially engaged citizens who are uh, well-informed uh, but I think what's striking uh, in some of these discussions is that, well, you know, you can actually have a relatively unskilled workforce, but still be competitive because you have labor policies that actually facilitate that competition. So if you think of the development trajectory of a country like Vietnam, uh, you know, they were able to leverage low skill, high uh, intensity manufacturing uh, to, to grow uh, their, their economy. Uh, the same can be said with Ethiopia. Uh, so, you know, I think the education system is obviously dysfunctional and that's a big problem, but we could be doing a lot better in terms of absorbing people who don't even necessarily have the high level skills that we spoke about earlier. Yes. And also um, when we talk about the structural misalignment of the um, skills and the markets, it's not entirely true because, of course, the service sector also provides a lot of job opportunities to less skilled people. Uh, if you think, for example, of, uh, um, say, uh, security guards, that's a, that's a service industry. Um, if telecommunications. You think of telecommunications, uh, the tourism industry, um, the hospitality industry, all offer a very large variety of jobs that do not involve mining, agriculture, or manufacturing, and that should be able to absorb a lot of um, works from our workforce. And partly the reason why that isn't happening is that we in South Africa have created an insider outsider problem where we treat the insiders who already have jobs very well as a result of union pressure and the union alliance with the um, governing party, the ANC. And that means that those people who do have jobs in South Africa are often quite well paid by international standards. And those who do not have pay, uh, do not have jobs, do not have a way into the labor market because they are kept out. And one of the ways in which they are kept out is through minimum wages, for example. In a country with an unemployment rate as high as ours, having minimum wage laws is really a way of making the labor market more sticky and making it far more difficult for um, young people, for example, to find a foothold in the economy, even if it is at a very low pay rate but at least getting in there, um, being able to accumulate some job experience, being able to build some uh, work networks and, and progress from there. It's really important to get this very first you know, um, step into the economy. It almost doesn't matter how you get there, but you need to have that in order to, to build a career and build experience. Um, and so what we need is a, a policy shift that makes it easier for young people um, to get into the economy. And uh, one of the proposals that has been made is uh, an exemption certificate, where you would say that as a young, young person, you can voluntarily um, apply for an exemption certificate. That means that most labor laws don't apply to you. You say, you do this by choice. You say, you know, I'm not going to worry about the hiring and firing rules, the most labor regulations, minimum wages. I don't want that to apply to me. I actually just want to get a job. 
So let me get an exemption certificate. Let me go to their various employers and say, I want to work. I'm willing to work at any condition, um, but I want to get in. And once you're in, then you've got the chance of building on that. So that would be one, one approach to doing that. Yeah, and I think what's so important is that you need to get your foot on the ladder. And especially when the education system is letting people down so badly, that initial job can be the way that you acquire the skills laterally to equip you to be more competitive in the labor market. If the education system can't give you the skills, then maybe another employer could give you those skills. Uh, yes. John, what about the uh, macroeconomic situation, the, the fiscal predicament that the government finds itself in? Uh, we, we've spoken more about the labor market and, and other areas of the, of the business environment, but what about government stewardship of the economy itself in terms of fiscal issues? Well, there again, we see this very marked distinction between pre-2007 and after 2007. And up to 2007, the South African government achieved something quite remarkable that not many governments do throughout the world, which is that it achieved a fiscal surplus. And what that means is that the government collected more money than it spent. It's a very, very unusual thing. Um, then the global financial crisis happened and Jacob Zuma got elected and spending took off. So the government started spending more and more money, far more than it was collecting. And as a result, that gap between income and expenditure became larger and larger. That is the fiscal deficit. And as those de deficits get rolled over from year to year and financed through borrowed money, it also means that the country's debt became larger and larger. And this process has been going on since uh, around 2010, 2012. And of course, it was exacerbated by last year and the COVID crisis, uh, where the government uh, intervened in order to support people um, so it spent more money. It also collected less because the economy shrank last year by 7%. And that means that the fiscal deficit expanded to 14% of GDP, which is an astronomical figure. It's an almost inconceivable figure. And even the projections by the finance minister indicate that the deficit will remain quite substantial into the short and medium term because it is so hard to make it smaller. And to give you a sense of the scale at which the deficit is at the moment, if you go back through South Africa's history, all the way back to 1913, just after um, South Africa became a, a unified state, the Union of South Africa, 1910, if you go back all the way and you try to find periods when the deficits were as serious as they are now, there are only three times, and that was after the two world wars, and it was at the end of apartheid as the state was running out of money. So really, we are in quite, quite a serious predicament at the moment. And obviously, South Africa's debt to GDP ratio has increased as a consequence of that profligacy. So uh, I think debt is set to balloon to over 100% debt to GDP ratio uh, over the medium term expenditure framework, which is essentially the next uh, three years. And we're spending a much greater proportion of our budget on debt service every year. Yes. Um, so the, the finance minister's projections at the moment, I think, are still quite optimistic. Um, he thinks that we can uh, limit ourselves at a high point of about 89% um, debt to GDP. But we think it will be quite difficult for him to do that um, because cutting expenditure is so hard, especially in a situation like ours. And increasing revenue is also difficult, again, because the economy is so weak. There's a Another interesting bit of information in the finance minister's growth projections, which is that in South Africa, we do have a debate about reform. And we hear talk about our president being reform minded. We hear a lot about reform being on the horizon. And one would expect these reforms to be of a nature that increase the economic growth rate. But if we look at the projections by the finance minister, we see that there are 3.3% for this year which is a bit of a rebound of the contraction of last year. And then they decline to between two and a half, one and a half percent in the next two to three years. And for, this, for us, this is an indication that the finance minister does not believe that reform is coming because those growth rates are really, really low, very, very weak compared to emerging market peers. We see the rest of the world at the moment um, beginning to come out of the crisis quite rapidly 
beginning to grow. Demand is, is surging. Um, you know, there are already some supply um, shortages in raw materials and in labor markets in other countries. But um, South Africa may well miss out on that because we do not have a um, conducive environment to investment and to growth at the moment. And we think that the finance minister knows this. And this is why his projections are so timid. Yeah, John, I think what really struck me in your earlier remarks was just that South Africa hasn't always been in this position. And in that first half, 94 to 2007, actually recorded you know, very high levels of economic growth, uh, which drove a lot of investment in other social programs and created a lot of other um, benefits in terms of uh, infrastructure and access to water, electricity, and so on for many poor people who have been denied those services in the past. Uh, but now uh, we are spending well beyond our means. And, you know, so I think there are a number of people who are trying to offer suggestions for how to turn this problem around. And there's no shortage of uh, very ambitious economic plans from the government. So there's the, the new growth path, there's the national development plan, uh, there was the uh, reconstruction uh, an economic recovery plan uh, that was announced last year. But you at the IR, you, you wrote a, a paper uh, in October last year, uh, where, which was called the Growth and Recovery Strategy to hashtag get SA working. And it was a, quite a simple document, only about 15 pages or so. So nothing like the 400 page national development plan that was released, I think it was in, in 2012. Um, so what are some of the uh, recommendations that you make there about how to grow South Africa's economy? And uh, remember, you highlighted some bitter pulls that needed to be swallowed. Uh, what are those exactly? Yes. Um, so I'd like to preface this section by saying that um, people watching this should respond by saying that what we're saying is completely unrealistic. But... This isn't the nature of a thought experiment. So this is like a thought experiment. What, what would happen if tomorrow morning, Sol Ramaphosa woke up and suddenly realized what kind of a mess we're in and decided to actually do something about it? So not just you know release spectrum and make visa requirements a little bit easier and have some more master plans, which is what currently seems to be the focus. All of those things won't work because they're far too little far too late, far too timid, and they don't really go to the core of what needs to change. And when we were thinking about this, you know, we did it in the sense of a thought experiment. We observed that the mood in the country is very despondent at the moment. So, you know, if you speak to people, they will tell you, well, you know, there's really no point, there's no hope, there's no chance. These problems are intractable, they cannot be changed, et cetera, et cetera. And to some extent, I think this has also affected the government itself which is, you know, it knows it has run out of money. It knows that ESCOM has run out of electricity. Uh, it knows that it's beset with corruption. It can't rely on its internal relationships or external relationships. And this is, you know, a, a mood that's dragging the country down. Now, you could try to change the mood, which um, you know, President Ramaphosa did at the beginning of his term. He had investment conferences, he had investment summits, and he would try to get investors to commit money to South Africa. And he would say that uh, improvements were coming, the new dawn was on, on its way, corruption was going to be dealt with. But uh, the thing is that you can't sell this with words alone. This is like vaporware, it's like software that, you know, which is promises lots of things which it cannot deliver. And that's what we've been getting so far. And if you want to change that, then you really have to go to, you know, make some really hard, hard changes, some very difficult reforms. And those are those bitter pills that you mentioned earlier. So what we wrote was that if you want to grow the economy, there are sort of four main points that you need to focus on. And these are not the bitter pills. These are easy. This is what you want to have. Um, and you would say you want to attract direct investment. So you want investors to look at South Africa and they look at Thailand and Chile and Bolivia and Mexico and Hungary, and they choose where to build whatever, a car factory or a factory for making widgets. And when they look around the whole world, we want them to pick South Africa. This is what this means. We want to attract direct investment. 
So it's a nice goal. It's uncontentious. You know, that's something I think everybody could agree on. Then we said we want to maintain and expand infrastructure because ultimately infrastructure is the thing that allows you to produce other things. So your road network, your rail network, your internet uh, speed, your electricity network, your communications, all of these are sort of really like the skeleton of a, of a strong economy. And at the moment, of course, what we're seeing is that many parts of the skeleton are falling apart or are being carried away and stolen and sold for scrap. And this is a very dangerous development because building is infrastructure is a lot more expensive and it takes a lot longer than selling it off and letting it degrade. So that's the second um, objective that we need in order to grow the economy. The third one is that we need to create a climate that is conducive to job creation. And we touched on that earlier. We need to make it easier for people to get into job jobs, even at the um, expense of decent work, which is, of course, a, a very big buzzword in South Africa. I think countries like Vietnam, Laos, and China did not work, worry about decent work. They worried about work, you know, get people into jobs. The jobs will become decent later, you know, when the, the labor market becomes tight. That's the third thing. And the fourth thing was to implement a program of widespread economic empowerment, because this has been nominally what the government has been aiming for. So the current program is called broad-based black economic empowerment, but it has turned out to be anything but that. A very small number of people has benefited from it, um, you know, at a high estimate, maybe 15% of the population, but that means that 85% of the population have been left out. And that is, you know, just a, a terrible indictment on the failure of these policies to really uplift the population. And so those are the four things that we need for growth. We need direct investment, we need infrastructure to be fixed and to be working. We need to make it easier to create jobs and we need to find a better way to get more people into the labor market and into the economy who are currently excluded from it. Yeah, so, I mean, it just reminded me of a, of a phrase that I read recently in Tony Leon's new book, which was attributed to Ken Andrew, which said, if you are passionate about alleviating poverty, you need to be passionate about economic growth. And I think it just sums up exactly uh, the ethos of of your report and some of the uh, some of the attributes that you just pointed out. So yeah, let, let's dive into those bitter pills. Let's uh, let's try to swallow those pills. Good. So the the sugar coating of those pills is that if you swallow them, you'll get growth. <laughs> this is what your incentive is, because otherwise they're not not very nice. I must make one one comment on what you just said about growth um, and alleviating poverty which is that uh, a few months back, an article was published by an advisor in the office of the president who claimed that the problem was not low growth leading to poverty and unemployment. She said it was the other way around. She said that uh, people are so poor that they can't buy goods and services and therefore the economy does not grow. So what you need to do is give people money, then they can go out and spend it and then the economy will grow. Um, so I don't know to what extent the president himself buys into that, but that is quite a worrying misconception. Um, so you really, you know, are putting the cart before the horse there if you try to do it that way around. And we, we, what we say is, no, you know, you need to get businesses to do the investing, to do the hiring, to do the training uh, in their own interest. So they've got profits out of it. And then that will create the jobs that we need. You can't really do it the other way around. You know, that's, that's not going to work. But um, coming to the bitter pills. So the first bitter pill is that we need a very firm commitment to property rights. And the reason why we raise this and our viewers from across the world might not know this is that South Africa or the, the government, the governing party has embarked on a program um, to adopt a set of policies described as expropriation without compensation. And the thrust of these policies is that some laws should be changed in order to give the government the power to seize private property, uh, including land, but also other types of property, without paying for it. And supposedly this is uh, subject to limitations, restrictions, and checks and balances. But our read is that those checks and balances are insufficient, and that these laws, if they were to be adopted, would confer such sweeping powers on a government that has already shown itself to be venal and corrupt, 
that the consequences would be quite devastating. And so if you're an investor from overseas or even within South Africa who's thinking about building a factory or buying a farm or starting a business, and you see the government at that very same time trying to put in place policies that would allow it to take whatever you've created without compensation, you would be very hesitant about investing in this economy. And uh, this was confirmed by the president's envoy, Trevor Manuel, the former finance minister, who was sent around the world to try to drum up investment for South Africa and was asked what the effect of EWC expropriation without compensation on his efforts had been. And he did say that it, you know, it made it quite difficult. Obviously, obviously it's going to make it difficult. So the first bitter pill would be for the governing party and the president to abandon this pursuit of undermining property rights. Um, expropriation without compensation is only one example of that. There are other policies also in the pipeline that uh, go in, this, in a similar direction. And one of those is the national health insurance, which in South Africa is a, a proposed system that would bring the entire private health industry under government control uh, and would centralize and monopolize the entire health sector. Um, and then again, there would be no compensation paid for this expropriation of private um, business rights, ownership rights, property rights. So that is another, another example. And the third one is the idea of prescribed assets, which is an idea that was floated by the government. Um, it was used by the apartheid government. Um, the idea behind it being that if the state really needs money, it should be able to tap into private pension savings. So that, you know, those, those savings are very considerable in South Africa. It is a figure in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and the government seems to have cast its eye on that pot with the idea of being able to take some of that money to save the national airline or to restore the national uh, electricity uh, utility to profitability or to help out other uh, parts of the, the, the government system that currently are all uh, requiring bailouts and are making losses from year to year. Um, and of course, this is another terrible idea because you know, private people save their private money in order to have a pension when they retire and to think that the government would be able to appropriate, appropriate a part of those savings for its own purposes um, is, is quite concerning. Okay, John, in South Africa, we have Black Economic Empowerment, BEE, as you mentioned earlier. What are some of your alternative proposals to the existing empowerment framework? Well, we've come up with a policy called the Economic Empowerment for the Disadvantaged Policy. Um, and what this does is that it emulates some of the best features of the social grant system in South Africa. And that is a system that we've looked at with uh, a lot of attention and also uh, very favorably in the sense that the social grant system in South Africa is one where grant benefits are paid directly from the central government to beneficiaries and there's no middleman in between. And the reason why this is important is that in many other interactions between the state and citizens in South Africa, intermediaries managed to interpose themselves and thereby managed to uh, a skim off a part of the, those monies for themselves, thereby leaving the beneficiaries ultimately worse off. And what EED suggests is that uh, many parts of uh, government spending, such as, for example, um, the school budget, should not be dispersed via provincial departments and district departments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but rather parents should receive a voucher that is, uh, has a certain monetary value which they would be entitled to spend at any school of their choice, be it private or government. So expenses wouldn't increase for the government. They would spend the same amount of money as they do at the moment on schools, but it would be parents who choose where to spend that money. And our expectation is that if that happens, schools would have to compete for the custom of the parents. In other words, they would need to persuade the parents that they are able to offer a good schooling for the children and parents would be invested in making sure that they get good schooling. It would also change the way in which decisions are made within the schools. So if you consider, for example, a government school that is becoming a bit dilapidated and run down, 
which has received, for argument's sake, 100,000 grand through school vouchers from parents. This school now has to choose what to do with that money. And it would be able to choose whether to pay the teachers more or whether it should paint the roof or whether it should increase security or whether it should uh, replace pit latrines through decent toilets because that would ultimately affect the success of the school. And that kind of uh, decision-making at the lowest possible level, at the local level, at the family level, we think will improve the outcomes quite considerably. And that would be the, the principle of subsidiarity, which states that decis decisions should be made at the lowest possible level in the schooling system, for example, at the level of a school and not at the level of a provincial education department or a national education department. And similarly, of course, um, having parents make decisions is also a reflection of subsidiarity. And the same principle could be extended also to the health sector and also to housing, which is another pressing need for many South Africans. Again, their uh, national budgets could be uh, broken down and distributed across all the people who are needy and allow them to make choices about where that budget gets spent. And those outcomes, we are sure, would be much, much better than what we're getting at the moment. Instead of being race-based, um, it would be needs-based, like the social welfare system is already. And instead of rewarding companies for having a certain uh, demographic representativity, it would reward companies for doing the things that actually generate growth and jobs. So, for example, companies could earn points for employing people, for hiring people. They could earn points for um, boosting exports. They could earn points for investing in the business. They could earn points for paying taxes, for example. And these are ultimately the things that we want companies to do. So those are the things that should be incentivized. It should not be things like achieving demographic representativity, which we think is a fool's errand in any case, because it can only be achieved through a lot of coercion, a lot of fines and punishment and controls and inspectors and verification agencies and laws and regulations and all these things that make doing business even more difficult than it already is. So our proposal would simplify that a lot and it would say, you know, really focus on incentivizing those things that you want businesses to do and reward them for those things. Yeah, absolutely, John. And I think incentives matter. And also you can still have the state providing the welfare, but they don't necessarily need to be the service provider. You could uh, empower uh, communities, uh, organizations, or individuals to uh, pr provide the services themselves and uh, also earn a profit from that. Uh, so I, I think another issue that we touched on earlier was the labor market and your third bitter pull is to liberalize the labor market. What does that mean in the South African context? Well, we touched on this a little earlier. Um, so at the moment, we've got the insider-outsider problem, um, and especially South Africa's youth are really excluded from the labor market and are finding it very difficult to break into the labor market. And one of the ways in which they're being kept out is that um, wages are relatively high in the private sector, and minimum wage laws conspire to keeping young people out who would be willing to work for a, a very low wage, but just to get you know, on, onto the ladder, their foot on the ladder. So we would scrap the minimum wage laws. Um, we would make hiring and firing a lot easier and less onerous on the employer. We would uh, remove requirements that uh, force companies to reflect representativity in their hiring or in their staff profiles. We would allow companies to make decisions based on merit. Um, you know, and uh, if hiring and firing were easier, it would be easier for companies to take a chance on somebody. You know, if, if a young guy comes up to my business asking for a job, um, at the moment, I'm going to think twice about giving him a job because, you know, there's a whole lot of regulation attached to that. Um, and I, I do get myself into a relationship that it's difficult to get out of. But if it were easy for me, I'd say, you know, come and work for me. I'll pay, you know, 300 rand a day. I'll try it for a month. And if you're good, you stay on and I'll increase your salary. And if you're no good, off you go, you know, then somebody else must come. But you need, you need this fluidity in the, in the labor market in order to also create more interactions between businesses and employees or potential employees. Um, so you need to get motion into the labor market. You need to get it flowing, circulating, and then more jobs will be created. 
So John, these are all very sensible recommendations, but there are significant political obstacles in the way. What are those obstacles and can South Africa implement some of these proposals in the way that you suggest? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's why I prefaced these remarks by saying it was a thought experiment. It's just to, you know, to take the sting out of these proposals, which otherwise might, be, might seem fanciful. Um, I don't think they are entirely fanciful, though, because um, these proposals could be implemented at very little cost, um, financial cost, where most of the other proposals, including the government's plans, do involve a lot of uh, spending money. You know, it's uh, very ambitious infrastructure plans and uh, master plans for different industry sectors and new commissions and agencies and task forces, you know, that are meant to improve things. It all costs a lot of money and it's actually not necessary. And um, you can achieve a lot more by removing the impediments from the economy than by trying to control it with even more agencies. The reason why it is difficult to implement these reforms is because the government has invested a lot of political capital into creating the current state of affairs. In other words, race-based policies form a cornerstone of government policy. And BEE is something that they're very strongly attached to and very heavily invested in. It will be very hard to let go of that. And the same is true of EWC and other policies that undermine property rights. The government uh, you know, has, has has the very firm intention of implementing those policies and to backtrack would be, would uh, imply a loss of face um, and possibly also a loss of power because of course, many of the voters who support the ruling party do so because they think its policies are worth supporting. And so abandoning those policies could mean losing that political support as well. And I think that is where the government is quite hesitant to, to change course. At the same time, the current setup also makes it relatively easy for large patronage networks to emerge within the state. Um, I'm thinking of cadre deployment, for example, as well as BEE policies that uh, make it possible to reward pals with jobs. Um, they make it possible through procurement policies to <clears throat> have lots of middlemen between the state and the service provider and they provide a lot of opportunity for corruption and rent seeking. And all the people connected to these patronage networks have an interest in making sure that they stay in place. They would not want to see that disrupted. And that probably is the largest obstacle to changing the status quo. Ultimately, what it means is that unless there really is a, a Damascene conversion on the part of the leadership, which is unlikely, I concede, change will need to come from the political sphere. In other words, the uh, negative outcomes of the current policies must become so evident and so um, uh, tangible for the populace that it will shift its votes to another party that offers better policies. And it's hard to say when we are going to get there, but ultimately we are going to get there. Um, because we can see the declining levels of support in, for the ANC already in elections and also in our polling. Um, and we foresee that continuing because the uh, state and the ruling party have both run out of money and not having the money to pay off the supporters really makes the hold on power precarious. Yeah, and I think that economics is to politics as gravity is to jumping. Sooner or later, <laughs> the economic forces are going to pull you back down to earth. And yeah. I think just reviewing your report before this call and this concept of subsidiarity, I think is so powerful. Uh, I think the problem with many of these plans, these, these kind of grand pieces of uh, legislation or, or reports is that they, they tend to have a kind of a centralizing command and control instinct. Um, which fundamentally is driven by a desire to engineer society according to a particular vision. Uh, and what is sometimes challenging about conveying the power and the importance of market economics is that you're essentially talking about emergent order, uh, that people following their own ends, pursuing the profit motive, trying to make a better life for themselves, will create positive externalities that they will 
create other opportunities for other people and uh, those those rising tides will lift all boats yeah that's a great point um and also uh, you know you do try to see things from your opponent's point of view because you know there's a reason why they do things the way they do and i think you're quite right that the the, the world view that prevails in uh, large parts of the governing party is that um you you fix things through government action and so the observations by government may be the same observations that we make which is that um unemployment is too high and growth is too low and poverty is increasing we share those observations with the government and we are both indignant about about these things and want to do something about them but where our inclination would be to say that you have to unleash the market and you have to set people free in order to make decisions about their own lives and that from that you will get the growth that you want and you will get the prosperity the government's interpretation is that uh, these failures and maladies are a result of insufficient planning and insufficient intervention. And therefore, the worse things get, the more the inclination on the part of government is to intervene more to fix these problems. So to pass more legislation, uh, to take greater control of the economy, um, and to interfere and intervene more, ultimately thereby making things worse. And that is a very fundamental underlying reason why things are getting worse. And it is also a very uh, fundamental reason why it is difficult to change this, because it's not just about policies, you know, writing a policy paper or changing a law here and there. It really is about the philosophy that underlies how you formulate your policies. What is that based on? And uh, that worldview at the moment is not the right one, we think, in the ruling party. It is one that was uh, shaped through uh, education in East Germany or by the Soviet Union, which were the countries that supported the ANC against apartheid, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and it seems that that mindset really hasn't shifted very much so far. Uh, and what, what we say is that you need to, if you want to fix things, you need to have faith in people, in ordinary people, and you need to let them get on with doing things that are in their interests. As long as there's a system of voluntary exchange in place, you can create mutual value out of those interactions. It's not a zero-sum game, but you have to let people interact and exchange um, voluntarily in order to get those benefits. Um, there's no other way of getting them. Yeah, and it reminds me of the quote by Friedrich Hayek, which is that the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to man how little he knows about what he thinks he can design, uh, which is to say that even the most enlightened and benevolent bureaucrats are not going to be able to conceptualize and conceive of the complexity of economic relations in a society. And uh, yeah, I think your, your mantra to, to trust people is important, but also you can't trust people too much. That's why you shouldn't empower government officials and civil servants uh, with kind of unbridled, unchecked uh, discretionary power as well. Yes. So you also want, um, you want the rule of law and not the rule by law which is sort of what we've got at the moment. And if you think of some of the uh, trials and uh, the courts at the moment, it does seem that there is one set of rules for the government and its officials and a different set of rules for ordinary South Africans. And that is uh, also quite concerning for investment because investors really do care about you know, rules being consistent, being predictable, being understandable and being fairly applied. Um, and that is something we, we are not so strong on at the moment in South Africa. Well, John Endres, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on the show. And to our viewers and listeners, please do check out John's report from October last year. Uh, many of the recommendations uh, have sadly not dated. I think they're very much relevant uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in today. And I think just reflecting on this conversation, it seems to me that there are no easy solutions, but there are definitely concrete steps that we can take uh, towards dealing with some of the, the very enormous problems that we are facing in South Africa on the economic front. Thank you very much, David. Yes, I think that's, that's a good concluding remark. Um, ultimately, you can ignore the laws of reality for only so long. Ultimately, they come to bite you. Um, and I think we are getting to that point in South Africa. And then hopefully we'll, we'll adjust our policies and our mindset in order to be more realistic and get the good results that we all want for the country. Thanks very much, John.
If you enjoyed this podcast, please do give it a like and also subscribe on YouTube as well as on your preferred podcast platform. That's it from me, David Ansara. And until next time, take care.